Good evening and thank you for joining Pep Talk. I'm your host, Rosie Peppy Park, and I'm delighted to have with me our guest this evening, the illustrious Dr. Claire Nelson, founder of the Institute of Caribbean Studies in DC. Please stay tuned. You will be wowed at the amazing things she has to share tonight. Brother, thank you so much for coming to the show. To be in these places at, at, at the time that. So, yeah, I'm in the right place at the right time. Okay. Yeah, what's up, no. I told you the Jamaican accent was going to come out. Yeah. I'd love to be able to name all the bands, and I can't. We'll but, get to but, it. but I know I'm going to miss You've been called selfless, you've been called kind, loving, all kinds of stuff. We know you're passionate about Talk about your little 10-month-old son. Yeah. Talk about that, your pride and joy, I love, of course. I love my son. His name is Jawari, and he was born on Christmas Day. He's wow. So, Dr. Nelson. I love to say Dr. Nelson. <laughs> First of all, I just love to say it. I read your bio, I mean, and the thing that struck me most is that you're the first Jamaican woman to have gotten a doctorate in an engineering discipline. Yes. Talk about that. Well, you know how it is growing up in Jamaica, I was privileged to go to the St. Hughes High School for okay. Girls. <laughs> when you were told you could do anything we wanted to right. be who we wanted to become. And I grew up in a very important time in Jamaica's history when um, we were made to feel like we could be whomever and change mm -hmm. whatever we wanted to change. And so as a math, physics, chemistry type student, mm -hmm. engineering was kind of where they kind of it was either medicine or engineering, and I didn't right. like dead people or frogs, so I kind of, I kind of was, you know, it had left engineering. It was either that or theater. Mm -hmm. And when I told my mother I wanted to do theater, she was like, mm, go back and come back again. We'll so, come again. So right? I came back with engineering. But you actually... Are, I do, yeah, I still I mean, do theater. Now that you're not a child anymore, anymore, I do theater. You, you do as theater. My very serious hobby. Very oh, okay. Hobby. And um, when did you leave Jamaica? I left Jamaica in 1976 um, to go to Buffalo. My first university was University of Buffalo in mm -hmm. New York. And I landed up the winter of Blizzard of 1977. So I, I said I had a good baptism mm -hmm. um, when I came to America. And that was where I sort of got really focused on becoming a Caribbean American as I got into mm -hmm. the whole Caribbean Student Association. And indeed, I was considered the mother of the Caribbean Student Association at wow. the University of Buffalo. Well, and I mean, you have done so many things in your career. I'm just going to roll off a few of them that I can remember because <laughs> her resume is just really too long for one show. I know <laughs> you took a group mm -hmm. to China, Oh yes. the China Friendship Project. Yes, yes, Briefly, yes, yes. talk about that. Well, the idea is that for the Caribbean, China's become like this big elephant in the room nobody wants to talk about. Forget how many billion people on the planet live in China are Chinese. And so rather than being afraid of the inevitable change in global economy, the way global culture is shaped, I thought it would be good to, for us to go mm -hmm. and see, you know, you were one of the people oh, who yeah, took yeah, to right. China, um, <laughs> to see what were, you know, people of African descent doing in China. Mm -hmm. So we hooked up with the Jamaicans, the trainees, the African students, and um, got a chance to meet with some of the ambassadors. We went before Beijing, and out of that we did a show about the Beijing Olympics. It was mm -hmm. really delightful to meet such really interesting and bright and talented mm -hmm. young people who had been studying in China for several years, speaking, you know, fluent Chinese. Like, Ni hao is all I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but the whole idea is that understanding the Caribbean not as, as a islands that we come from, but as a global space. Right. And because the Caribbean is more than its location, the Caribbean is a way of being. And then I remember quite distinctly while we were in China, you actually conducted an interview in Spanish. <laughs> it was really bad Spanish, but that was true. <laughs> it was funny because, I mean, I never think of myself as speaking Spanish. But this gentleman only knew, only cut the language he had to call was Spanish. Right. <laughs> so here it is, someone who's supposed to be speaking Spanish. I never speak Spanish unless I'm forced to. Mm -hmm. So speaking in China, you know, in Spanish. It was a really interesting experience. I don't want to repeat it. Right. But actually, I may have to because I do want to do some work with the black community in Latin America. It's one of my passions mm -hmm. is working on African people's development. And we have 150 million people of African descent 
in Latin America who are very marginalized and I see as part of my future, you know, continuing to tell their story to a, lo a larger world. Okay. So when did you start the Institute of Caribbean Studies and why? I started the Institute of Caribbean Studies back in 1993 to be a voice for Caribbean people, partly because it was the Reagan era. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit annoyed that every time there was an issue, you had all these pundits on TV talking about the Caribbean, this and the Caribbean, that, that there was never a Caribbean person. Mm -hmm. And I was annoyed at that, and I wanted to say, wait a minute, we don't have people who can speak for ourselves. Of course, I was young, and I thought that well, I could actually change the world. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, there was no... Caribbean American voice. There was no, we had lots of social clubs, but Washington and the power base in Washington it functions around, you know, the think tanks, the advocacy groups, and we had none of those. So I started ICS to be a think do tank. So we mm -hmm. want to think, but we also want to do things like advocate, as well as to focus on how do we create development that fosters our success and prosperity here in America as well as in the Caribbean. And I know that one of the huge things that you did, a major, major accomplishment from ICS, is the whole being that person who was responsible for June to be Caribbean American Heritage Month. Yes, it was. You have to talk about it, that. Sometimes I think about it and I said, and I didn't leave Jamaica to do this, but I think sometimes God has a divine plan that things fall into place. It started out in 1999 in a conversation I was having with the then White House Outreach Director for African American Communities. And she was very much um, aware of the fact that Black America was changing into this multicultural space. Mm -hmm. Many African Americans in power don't seem to understand it, but she got it. So she really tried to pull the Caribbean groups in and one day she said to me well how come you people don't have a month like the Hispanics and mm -hmm. I said yeah I have a nice idea because they still have like you know the Caribbean week at schools all right, of us right, who go right. to university mm -hmm. have that but how do we do that and she said well I'll help you mm -hmm. so that's why I knew it was possible so having that impetus and then there was a, um, a group in Washington who was trying to do it locally so I signed up with them then they kind of got tired and fell away from the <laughs> curb, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But because I knew it could happen, I, I kind of formed and left with another group of people with Trans Africa Forum mm, and the Caribbean right, right. Bank Fund Association. And we started doing a film festival, the DC mm -hmm. Film Festival, just to have an event that we could say, June is Caribbean American Heritage right, Month. Right. And you have to kind of claim the space mm -hmm. in order to make it a reality. And, and again, luck means opportunity. Congresswoman Barbara Lee had that same idea. How come it's not a Caribbean month? So her staff person, who knowing I was already doing this locally, right. said, no, let's work together to do this. Mm -hmm. So kitchen table, draft the bill, myself and her staff person. And it was a wonderful experience to see that bill, you know, go through the process. 2004, we had events on the hill. You know, it took time to get more Congress people to sign on. But I learned the process then of how you get a bill from an idea through the process. Mm -hmm. Then the Congress passed in 2005. Then Senator Schumer in January of 2006 took it and attached to another bill that had other quote unquote days like Jewish months, I think, right. in January. <laughs> of course, you know, they're not going to like pass one and don't pass the other. Very shrewd move, Chuck. And so <laughs> on February the 14th, Valentine's Day 2006, I got the call from mm -hmm. Barbara Lee's office. And Jamila said, Clear, guess what? It passed the Senate. And then Bush um, signed it eventually mm -hmm. on June 6th right. after many phone calls because he did not want to do it. So um, people were calling and I had people from around the country calling their Congress people and their senators and getting it done. But that's the first part. Right, right. Now, how do you use this space to now construct the reality? Mm -hmm. And it's not just saying you have a month. If we have a month and we end up just doing parties and fets and with t-shirt parties, then we're not really achieving anything. The point of having a Caribbean American Heritage Month is to demonstrate that we are here. And especially now in this climate for immigration, the whole Arizonation problem, as right. I call it, you know, mm -hmm. where <laughs> people of color are and are kind of sort of being thought of as like coming to quote unquote take or do something bad to America. Mm -hmm. We have to make it clear. Now, when people from the Caribbean come, when immigrants of color come, we're also coming to give. Mm -hmm. And so we're very proud to be able to use Caribbean American Heritage Month to educate Caribbean American leadership how to negotiate the power space between the people in the policy at the local level, the city councils, the mayors, the county executives, the Congress, and of course, you know, in the White House. Because we, we now have a, a, almost like a, 
every year since right. 2006, we have a White House briefing, we have events on the Hill. So we are beginning to claim our power, our voice, and our agency um, here in America, like every other immigrant group, right. an immigrant group has. And it's very important that we continue to build that momentum. I'm very excited about it, <laughs> I as tell. you can tell, because, you know, what has happened is that I see young leaders stepping up, mm -hmm. new leadership stepping up. There we have a group in Atlanta who is being formed, new leadership, Tallahassee, Los Angeles, Boston, uh, Chicago. People are organizing and new leaders are being formed and new alliances are being formed. And I hope and I pray that in five years, we're going to have a power base mm -hmm. of you know a good 50 groups in every state, at least two. They can pick up the phone and, and know that their congressman will take their call. That's what we're aiming for. Excellent. So that was a mouthful. But Caribbean American Heritage Month is celebrated all of June. They have a number of cultural, political, all kinds of events designated for everyone who is a Caribbean American to get involved. When we come back, we'll talk about the Caribbean American Heritage Awards and some of the other work that Dr. Claire Nelson is doing in the community. There was a time when we walked this earth with such glory, such dignity. We were in our own land and we were kings and queens, princes and princesses. We held our heads high. We were noble, a royal nation. Ours was a land civilized, so civilized we ruled with each other and not over each other. There was religious liberty in the land of nobility till the raiders came and forced unto us what they call Christianity. In case you're just joining us, my guest this evening is Dr. Claire Nelson, founder of the Institute of Caribbean Studies, D.C. And before the break, we just spoke a lot about June being Caribbean American Heritage Month and all the wonderful work that uh, has been doing in the community, various events for everybody. And now we're going to ask Dr. Nelson to tell us a little bit about the Caribbean American Heritage Awards, which is a big thing. You're in your... Yeah, it's like we're... Um, well, this year will be our 18th year. We started wow. in 1994. And the idea is that just as how we have Caribbean Heritage Month, Caribbean American Heritage Month, we wanted to, again, recognize the contributions of, um, immigrants are making mm -hmm. to America. And most people don't know, for example, that the Black National Anthem was written by James William Johnson has Caribbean roots, mm -hmm. Earl Graves, Eric Holder, well, Colin Powell, and the list goes on. So the Caribbean American Heritage Awards is like the NWACP image awards, right. if you will, of the yeah. Caribbean community. Mm. And we have built it up to have this, you know, appeal and brand. It is the signature event, I like to call it, in our community. And we're always delighted every November, second Friday every mm -hmm. November, that people come out, you know, dress up in their black tie and look glam. And we have a red carpet and we're building a brand and really hope that each year we continue to get better and better. But the important thing is to recognize the people of Caribbean heritage that bring contributions to make America great. Not just in politics, but in science, in technology, mm -hmm. in business. We're here, we're doing good, and we're helping to make America better. Okay, and of course, this is your 18th year. Yeah. We're still in 2010. So, just name a few people memorable who you can remember who have received Caribbean American Heritage Awards over the 18 years you've been doing this? Well, between 94 and 2010, we've honored people like Earl Graves, we've honored Susan Taylor, people would know that mm -hmm. name. We've honored um, Jimmy Cliff, people mm -hmm. know that name. Marcy Griffiths in industry, in the music industry, and other doctors and scientists, not mm -hmm. so famous, but well-known. Dr. Kater um, Lorenzing, for example, he's the first vice president of Medicine at Connecticut Hospital, the first position even named that. So lots of people from lots different people. backgrounds, yes. And what, what's the criteria? How do you go about selecting these people to be nominated for their awards? Their nominations are based on their impact on their industry mm -hmm. at, on a national level. So you will have to, if you're a scientist, for example, you probably have had a patent, mm -hmm. you probably have been quoted in many scientific journals, you probably have been the dean of some university and famous right. for something. So it's that level of impact. 
and I've been there. I know it's very nice. Black tie, lots of people. You have your dinner, you have your presentation, you have awards. And like all Caribbean events, you have a Caribbean after party. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, for the 18th year, who are you honoring in 2010? A in couple two, of the awards. In 2010, we'll be honoring... Um, uh, locally, Dr. Wayne Frederick, he's on the mm -hmm. 40. We started a new category called the Vanguard Award. Oh, Every year, okay. somebody on the 40. And he's a surgical oncologist at Howard University, getting a lot of rave reviews from mm -hmm. the oncology industry, quote unquote. Uh, we're on it also a Dr. Edward Chung, who is a, um, a Ruben scientist at NASA. Mm -hmm. um, did something with the satellites. I don't know, a you know, very big thing. <laughs> and then from a brand name that people would know, who Rita, Rita Mal is mm -hmm. being honored. And this we added a new twist. We have many more special guest artists in 2010. And we are we're bringing in um, Sensi Love Whaler, who is Bunny Whaler's daughter, to be a special guest artist wow. to do tribute to Rita Mali, mm -hmm. as well as a, a Haitian saxophonist, Joby Omise, will be a special guest artist. So we have, like, you know, mixing it up again mm -hmm. and building the vibe. So we'll have a really great um, event. Excellent. And so apart from the Caribbean American Heritage Month and Caribbean American Heritage Awards, you, you are also very popular at where you work in your day job. I think I'm a true job, Caribbean right? person. I have many jobs. But really, my Caribbean work is a part of my larger work in terms of myself as a woman of African descent. Right. And um, 2011 is the year, UN Year of African Descent. And one of the things we're going to be focusing on is ensuring that the voice of the marginalized people of African descent get heard. Mm -hmm. And I see my Caribbean work as part of that trajectory of ensuring that we who have been, quote unquote, the most brutalized people mm -hmm. um, of the world, really be find ourselves, find our voice, our identity, become empowered, um, view yourself as equals in any level, and also be, be treated with equity in the global marketplace. Mm -hmm. Because whether it's a Jamaica, a Haiti, or a Benin, or a, or a Zambia, we find always that people of African descent are at the base. Right. And so my goal and my view is to use this um, platform of Afri UN Year of African descent to harness the energies of African communities from Argentina to Ecuador to Colombia, our brothers and sisters who are from Jamaica who migrated to Nicaragua mm -hmm. and Costa Rica and San Andres in Colombia, really to bring us together again to sort of revisit where, who we might become in this changing global environment. Because you know how it is. I mean, everything is changing so fast. You know, times are hard everywhere. Between the earthquakes, the floods, the volcanoes, etc., everybody's getting hit. And yet still, other people are moving forward. Right. But people of African descent are kind of stalling. stalling. And so I want to use the talent I have as, I don't know, an engineer, social entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and even as a performer in the writing I do to kind of create this space for us to grow. And so, you know, like even, you know, even the work I do in my writing, my poems, I tend to be very much focused on yeah, uplifting, uplifting people and really um, helping us to see ourselves as, as, as with the potential to be all we can be in a very different way than we are. And, and one of the great things about Dr. Nelson that she's doing also, she's also imparting her knowledge to the youth. Because I know you work very closely with younger people. Yes, I'm very, I don't want to be guilty of doing to others what was done to me while I started ICS. Mm -hmm. I would try to make a point in a meeting and because I was like the youngest person in the room, nobody would take me on. So I'm very constructive about bringing young voices in. We have a project with some Haitian young people called Imagine IT, for example. And the idea is to use vision and processes. Imagine IT 2030. Haiti is not going to change if there's not enough of a metaphysical belief that it can change. Right. So, if we, and listen, 20, 20, 30 years from now, I want my rocking chair, like eating <laughs> ackee and sawfish, right? I do not want to be stuck on the four o'clock organizing right. events. So Let's you get want the young straight. people to so know. If I can bring in some of those 20 year olds, groom them, give them some of the knowledge that I know, you know, talk to them about, okay, you're 20, when you're 45, what, what do, do you, you want, want to, to see, mm -hmm. right? What will you help to make happen? Then part of our process is using foresight, using futures thinking, futures right. approaches to construct mm -hmm. the belief first. Development is a state of mind. So first we construct a vision of what 
Haiti is, Jamaica is, Nigeria, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Then, if enough people believe it, then it will be constructed. But you first have to have the belief that this can be before it can become a reality. And then, I know also on your resume, one of the newer titles that you have is that you're a futurist. Exactly. So my well, who is a futurist? Well, a Apart futurist, from you, what is a, that really? Well, a futurist <laughs> is somebody who, um, in their daily life, actually is engaged in thinking about and, con and constructing the future, what mm -hmm. the future will be like. Because f the future doesn't just happen. The future is something we are creating it's even creating. now. Exactly. And we tend to be, as black people, they, they, they quote, unquote, we take what is given to us, right? I'm saying we need to change that. If you go to a futures conference, they're probably, if you have 1,000 people in the room, there are less than 10 people normally of color in that room. Mm -hmm. I intend to ensure that we change that. So as a futurist, I am using the techniques of strategic foresight thinking to help to change the conversation right. for communities of color about the future. So we begin to become constructors as opposed to reactors in the world that we live in. Excellent. Yeah. And you know, we could go on well, uh, and on uh, and on, uh, but in the interest of time, we can't and we shan't. So we're going to stop right here. We we're definitely going to have a part two with Dr. Nelson. She's won so many awards, both in her acting career, in her professional career, during her work with ICSDC, all over. She's well known in the community. And if you need to know more about some of the work that she's doing, you can visit www.icsdc.org. Okay. Again, that's the Institute of Caribbean Studies. And this is Dr. Claire Nelson. And we want to thank you for watching Pep Talk. And we want to thank Dr. Nelson for being a guest on our show. Thank you.